Pope Francis releases his long-awaited apostolic exhortation on the Amazon Synod. We'll tell you what he said, especially about priestly celibacy. The papal posse, Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, join me in studio with in-depth analysis. Later, the communist Chinese government is imposing new rules on churches and religious organizations. Just what do they require? And how is the coronavirus affecting worship in China? The Bishop Emeritus of Hong Kong, Cardinal Joseph Zen, is here with an update. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An important show for you tonight. Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, and Cardinal Joseph Zen are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. First, some news from the world over this week. The U.S. bishops are supporting President Donald Trump's proposal to expand school choice. The plan is, quote, firmly rooted in the teachings of our Catholic faith. This according to Bishop Michael Barber, the chair of the USCCB Committee on Catholic Education. The bishops issued a statement in appreciation following a visit by Vice President Mike Pence and Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos to a Catholic school in Philadelphia. And on Wednesday, the big news of the week, Pope Francis released his apostolic exhortation on the Amazon Synod, which took place back in October. Now, the text entitled Beloved Amazonia deals with evangelization, care for the environment and the poor, inculturation of the liturgy, and the role of women in the church. To the surprise and consternation of many, Francis did not address the question of the ordination of married men to the priesthood as was widely expected. Joining me now with in-depth analysis of the newly released Apostolic Exhortation and much more is the Papal Posse, Editor-in-Chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, and Canon Lawyer and Priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Thank you both for being here. Gents, I want to start with this issue of celibacy, since, contrary to a lot of people who said we created it or, uh, you know, others created this celibacy controversy, which we'll get to in a moment, it was the most reported and hotly contested issue at that synod. Expectations were high in some circles that Francis would permit limited ordination of married men, relaxing the rule of priestly celibacy. But there was no mention of it at all in the final exhortation. In fact, the Pope reinforced church teaching regarding the unique role of the priest. He had this to say, and then I want your reaction. He says, it is important to determine what is most specific in a priest that cannot be delegated. The answer lies in the sacrament of holy orders, which configures him to Christ the priest. The exclusive character received in holy orders qualifies the priest alone to preside at the Eucharist. This is his particular principle and non-delegable function. Now, your thoughts, first of all, as we said earlier, it, it, he doesn't really rule out the ordination of married men. Is this a papal dodge, Father Jerry? I don't believe so. I think it was a very happy day when the synod uh, document was issued by Pope Francis because he was asked by the synod for two things. One is to have married men ordained priests, and secondly, to have women ordained as deacons, and the pope did not grant those requests. Mm -hmm. In fact, as you point out, he talked about the role of the priesthood. He also said the solution for bishops in that area is to pray for vocations mm -hmm. and then to also send more people, more missionaries to come in. So I'm very happy because the Pope upheld what I think is an immemorial tradition. I know it to be such, but I think it's also the most valuable reality in the life of the church, unmarried priests. Robert Royal, uh, he didn't explicitly pronounce on ordaining married men, but he also didn't give progressives what they wanted, and they are angry. I mean, the pieces coming out disappointed, demoralized, painful. Uh, instead, I think the Pope has done uh, in this document is to close the door, some have said. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think that the reaction um, by many people who expected that there would be a change here, I mean, we've even, even seen people say that he lacked courage to state what they believe he, he in his heart of hearts really 
thought. Mm -hmm. Now, this is always a danger when you when you set up expectations like this. I mean, I think this is very similar in a way to what happened with the Birth Control Commission way back in 1968 oh. with Paul VI. Everyone assumed that he was going to change mm -hmm. it, and then at the last moment, even though his own commission had recommended something, he did mm -hmm. something else. Um, I, I'm going to disagree a little bit for once with my colleague, Father oh, Murray. Oh, goodness. Mark, mark your DVRs. Go ahead. And, and it's this. I mean, as many people have, have said, very early on in this document, the Pope says, I'm not going to quote from the final report of the Synod, mm -hmm. because we have that, and I, I don't want to just pick and choose there. I want to accompany that document. Mm -hmm. And I, I really would like everyone to go back and read the whole thing. Right. And I think there's a reason why he does that. I think that... I think that might have been intended to just leave a, the Well, the I'm going to get into that. Open. We're going to play yeah, yeah, We're going to yeah. play the press conference because that is the operating narrative. Now, I want to go back to something else, uh, Father Jerry, and I'll let you respond to Bob. There is the supposition out there, the narrative, that it was Cardinal Sarah, it was Benedict, it was Mueller, it was uh, uh, Cardinal Brandmuller. These are the people responsible for elevating this uh, uh, celibacy controversy. Can you explode that canard, please? <laughs> and what impact do you think the Sarah uh, Benedict book had on this, their book on syllabus? Right. No, the, when, when the Pope originally talked about an Amazon synod, he did so in reference to a bishop, Fritz Lobinger, who had written a book about ordaining viri probati, about married men being ordained to the priesthood. The Pope then put it on the synod agenda. He made an advocate of, this, of that proposal to ordain married men, Cardinal Hummus from Brazil. He was made the relator general. Mm -hmm. He was the one uh, who was basically spearheading uh, the document that came out of the Synod. So there were a lot of expectations, and those haven't been met, of course, by the final decision. And I think it's fair to say that Cardinal Sarah and Pope Emeritus Benedict's book did have an influence on Pope France, had an influence on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. What the exact specification when the Pope made his decision? Uh, not to endorse this proposal. We don't really know. Mm. But, you know, to say that a controversy that should never have occurred occurred because some recalcitrant people defended the tradition of the church, <laughs> that is just a, a basic debating tactic used to end a debate or end a discussion. The mm -hmm. Pope himself said, we want open discussion in the life of the church. I think that's what he got, and the result in the end, I think, is very good. Bob, you wrote a column about uh, the function of the exhortation in relation to the final document. I want you to, to react to this uh, because, uh, as you mentioned a moment ago, some say he did not close the door to ordaining married men, and they point to the fact that the ex in, the, in the introduction to this exhortation and at the press conference, they mentioned the Amazon document and say, you know, this is almost side by side. And there was a controversy about whether this is magisterial or not, whether this is part of the normal magisterium. Now, this is Cardinal Michael Scherzny, uh, special secretary to the Synod, reacting to a question about the magisterial nature of this. Watch. So I would like to ask Cardinal Chani, you highlighted in the initial part of the exhortation Mm, that they this that there is sort of the inclusion of the final document in a sort of magisterium. So this means that from that final document, a bishop's conference can make decisions on the topic of the ordination of married men. The, the final document is included in the Holy Father's magisterium. I said that the Holy Father uh, presents the final document to us with his uh, exhortation as proposals made by the Synod, which he uh, encourages the church in the Amazon, the church everywhere, and people of goodwill to read and to appreciate and to uh, benefit from, apply in proportion to the reality in which they find themselves. The apostolic exhortation does not speak about the approval of the final document. It speaks about presentation, but not approval. Document has a certain moral authority, but does not have a magisterial uh, authority. That, that was Cardinal uh, Lorenzo Baldesseri. Uh, Bob, first crack. Is there, you believe there's credence here that there might be an opening by presenting the original uh, Amazon document along with this exhortation, that, that somehow elevates it. Why? 
Well, I, because there's, there's ambiguity, I and mean, we, we know that that's kind of a hallmark of what the Holy Father does. He doesn't like to pronounce definitively on, on certain questions. So it's out there. I think, that, though, that what you hear there is that at least for now, and this must be coming from the Holy Father himself, mm -hmm. he doesn't want to be hitting that note too hard. In fact, just today, mm -hmm. there were some American bishops in Rome who were on their, their uh, ad limina visits, mm -hmm. and he was even denying that that married priest was a major part of why he convened the, right. the synod in the first he said place. It's not that what it, the synod was yeah, about. That it's mostly about the Amazon and, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, saving the earth and kind of an integral human ecology and whatnot, and that other people sp spoke about this. So I think there's a plausible deniability here, but as we've seen in the past, um, you know, the famous footnote 351 in yeah. Amoris Laetitia, which does not say that people can uh, be divorced and, 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 and remarried and receive communion, but it's hinted that, mm -hmm. that it's there. We've seen that that kind of an ambiguity in the past can give rise to all sorts of speculation. And I think in this case, the speculation is really very foggy because, in my view, I mean, if I, if I were to, to say where we ought to go forward from yeah. this, and I think this is a very hopeful thing, I, I began to think this at the end of the Second Family Synod, frankly. I think we take the document as written. We take the black and white words that are written on the page, and mm -hmm. we say, that's as far as it goes and no farther. Mm -hmm. And all the rest is, is speculation, but it is not to be ignored that it's, there's a possibility that something else can mm. come back. Father Jerry, as a canonist, what does all that that we heard uh, from that press conference mean? And is this a backdoor blessing, if you will, to married clergy at some future time? I don't think it is. I think that's basically just uh, kind of canonical fuzz talk to say it's magisterial, moral influence, all the rest. The magisterium means the teaching action of the pope, mm -hmm. and he taught through his document. The other document was a bunch of suggestions given by a synod. Yeah, how do, how do a proposal and a request have magisterial yeah, so those authority? Don't have magisterial value. Now, as, does this leave a back door? Anything can happen, but I just look at it in the context. T for two years, we've been talking about the possibility of a married clergy, and when the final word came down, there is no married clergy. Right. I can't see the Pope turning around and saying tomorrow, okay, who else wants a married clergy? German hierarchy? Mm -hmm. Let's have a meeting to talk about it with you people. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we should look, though, at the deeper question is, why are we focusing on a married clergy? Right. Why is this a solution? This has really little to, or, or nothing to do with providing pastoral service to people. This is about getting rid of the discipline of celibacy. We know the German hierarchy is having a series of meetings now to propose that. This has to end that discussion. Mm -hmm. And I hope the Pope will come forward and say to them, if it's a dead end in the Amazon, it's more than a dead end in Germany. And, and, You've and got to avoid it. Yeah, this. and the thing that has me scratching my head is we've heard for months, this is a, yes, it's about Amazonia, but it also has implications for the universal yes. church. Now we're told by the Pope himself to these visiting bishops, uh, this is just about the Amazon. It was about their little area of the world, and that's all we were talking about. And now these other people are upset because they didn't think I was courageous enough and that, you know, I'm, that the Holy Spirit isn't wrong. I'm wrong, he told them. Um, look, I don't know why we're having these things. There. If, if it's not a big deal, why are we worrying about it? And the other thing, we keep hearing this term, the liturgy should be incarnate. Uh, 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 care for the environment should be incarnate. I'm not quite sure what that means, but why aren't clear answers incarnate in these documents and from the church? This kind of third way that we're hearing from some progressives now in the media, that the Pope has found a third way. We'll just discern our way to the desired outcome that we wanted in the first place. This strikes me as just uncatholic, silly. Yeah, that, look, there, there's this attempt to go by what he calls contradictions, and there's, there's going to be some sort of a third you know, synthesis that's going to be various third ways that are going to emerge from the, these conflicts that are out there. Look, I do believe that he has a, 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 a burning concern about environmentalism. We've seen that in throughout sure. the papacy. Sure. And it's one of the central themes of, of what he's about. Yes. But again, we, we can't overlook the fact, I've said this on this show before, that if that was meant to deal with the Amazon, with certain elements that would mm -hmm. have a universal application, why not then hold that meeting in the Amazon itself? Get the right. bishops together, and they could actually maybe some of them visit certain places. And, and, and they have climatologists and people coming through the Vatican all the time. Have, a, in, have in, an environmental 
Instead, they brought, it, they brought it to Rome, and they brought Pachamama as well to mm -hmm. Rome, and created the expectation that what was being talked about there was inevitably going to have applications mm -hmm. to the Universal Church. So yeah. uh, although we're, we, we think this is good at this point, I'm, I'm always a little bit skeptical okay. because ambiguity I, never seems to go away. I am going to ambiguously move on to the next <laughs> topic. Uh, the role of women was addressed, but not in the way progressives had hoped. There was a big move for deaconesses at the Synod, holy orders for women. In fact, the Pope went in the opposite direction in his exhortation. He writes, for centuries, women have kept the church alive in those places. This summons us to broaden our vision, lest we restrict our understanding of the church to her functional structures. Such reductionism would lead us to believe that women would be granted a greater status and participation in the church only if they were admitted to holy orders. But that approach would, in fact, narrow our vision. It would lead us to clericalize women, diminish the great value of what they've already accomplished. Now, Father Jerry, th to this pope, clericalize is a bad word. Um, this is a far cry from what we heard during the Synod. It certainly is, and it is, uh, for me, a good idea to just stop talking about women deacons. Not only would it clericalize them, it would also uncatholicize them because it's impossible to ordain a woman a deacon. We've had women who got so-called ordained priests by dissident bishops, and they were excommunicated. You, women cannot receive holy orders. This is not a patriarchal impo imposure on uh, the church. Mm -hmm. This is the will of God as expressed through Christ's decision at the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he talks about the feminine genius uh, within the document about their care for nature and for people. Mm -hmm. I think we should focus on that. Uh, you and I know anyone who lives in a Catholic parish knows most of the work that happens pastorally is done between the cooperation between women and priests mm -hmm. uh, because they are the CCD teachers, the teachers in Catholic schools, they're the ones who basically staff the volunteer Take organizations. Care of the altar, do, yeah. And then look at where did you learn your faith? My mother taught me my faith, mm -hmm. grandmother, all the rest. Mm -hmm. Women, to say women are unappreciating the church is an absolute falsehood and a calumny that's used basically to get power and to say until you put our women in charge of things, we're not going to shut up. People who want to uncatholicize the church are those who are proposing women's ordination, mm. and the Pope has said no. I want to speak very quickly about the main thrust of this document, which is the four chapters dealing with the environment. Uh, the Pope calls them dreams. It's a very poetical sequence, uh, and he, he's talking about environmental concerns, enculturation, uh, protecting the poor, and these are dreams he has. Uh, he quotes Pope Benedict and, and John Paul extensively. Mm. What do you think is at play there? Well, I don't know exactly. I mean, I, I think that this uh, this dr Amazonian dreaming, as I've called it, is is uh, not helpful for the kinds of problems that we're, we're really facing here. Because I, I, I've written an entire book about environment and religion, and many of these problems are engineering problems. They, they're either badly handled or they're well ha handled. We're not going to go back to primitive existence in the jungle where the trees are whispering to us and there's a myst cosmic mysticism of, mm -hmm. uh, of life. In a world of seven billion people, what you're going to have to deal with are some very hard, abstract problems of engineering, of environmental manipulation. To get back to the point where you, you, you've got clean waters, clean air, you manage your, your environment as, as well as you can. The idea that there's somehow mysticism or prophecy or quoting poets, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of all that. I like, I, I like reading <laughs> You love poetry. poetry? Dante? Uh, yeah, but the, the, the idea that that is somehow going to give us anything other than a kind of a warm feeling about what we ought to do, it, it doesn't just seem to me that that goes very far. And that is, the, the, the dreams are not only about environmentalism yeah, and, and about politics it. and whatnot. There's also the ecclesial dream, which is chapter okay. four. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, dreams of our Holy Father. Uh, I hope Barack Obama may have to get some residuals there before we're finished here. Uh, I need to move on to this. This was, to my eye, it became the symbol of the Amazon Synod. And anyone casually watching, what you probably know of the Amazon Synod was Pachamama, that idol that showed up at the very beginning at a prayer service and then kept reappearing throughout. Now, the Pope talked about using these indigenous symbols going forward. Here's what he writes. It is possible to take up an indigenous symbol in some way without necessarily considering it an idolatry. Father Jerry, that was obviously a reference to the Pachamama controversy that blew up all over the Synod and really dominated it. 
Well, I'd say it's possible, but it's not advisable. If you are going in to say, I proclaim a new message, the new message of truth, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, has saved the world by dying and rising from the, uh, rising from the dead, you don't admit, then you turn around and say, by the way, these false gods that you have here, get rid of them. We're not going to have them around anymore. Mm -hmm. Paganism is not a ben beneficent, you know, kind of like nature story in which people get along. Paganism is about fear of pagan gods who are vicious and who hurt people and you placate them as the Aztecs did by killing human beings. Mm -hmm. Paganism is about primal fears and anxieties that are not remedied because they don't know the true God. It's diabolical in, ori in origin and inspiration. The best thing, it, sure, you want to have an anthropological museum with Papa Mama statues there and say this was built and you know, made 20 centuries ago and people thought it was this, that's fine. Don't bring a pagan statue into the Holy See on mm -hmm. Vatican grounds and into St. Peter's, have people prostrating themselves, holding it in procession. We hold saint statues in processions, okay? We don't... Barely. Yeah, Barely. Well, we, it's that's the in, tradition. In time gone by, we I did, mean, yeah. Well, you know, the great Italian saint yeah. festivals and Caring. all the rest with the bands. That, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Pagan statues, please. Leave them apart because it confuses people. Mm -hmm. And by the way, people have nothing to do with paganism, like the uh, Mr. Shugel from Austria. He was scandalized by it. Why shouldn't we, the concerns of Europeans and all the rest who say, what are we telling pagan statues have a role in Catholic worship? They have right. no role. Because if they, if they have a role in Catholic worship in the Amazon, why can't they have a role in Catholic worship in New sure. York and, or Washington? Sure. And what about, hey, let's dig up some Greek and Roman say, uh, pagan gods and say, well, they're really ancestors of the same. They predate it. No, yeah. no, no. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have to move on. Uh, there was a lot of talk this week. Uh, Cardinal Mueller uh, believed that this was, a Mueller rather, believed that this was a document of reconciliation, Bob. And uh, yet at the same time, there was a lot of fallout around this synod that has and hasn't been reported. Archbishop Georg Ganswein, who is the secretary of the papal household, was essentially sidelined. Does this seem to your eye payback for his involvement in the Cardinal Sarah Benedict XVI book on clerical celibacy that may have had an effect on this final exhortation? Well, we can't know for certain, of course, but. The, the, the clear fact that the person who's the prefect of the papal household is disappeared, as they say in Latin America, tells us that something important happened. There was, as, as usual, the Vatican PR machine mishandled this and said yeah. he had his, his duties were, were rotated. rotated or reassigned or something. But that's obviously a, a, a way of saying that he's been removed from, yeah. from the office. It's impossible to say how important that book may have been in the final decisions that the Holy Father had to make. But it's clear that the fact that that was out there raised the stakes, I think, to a quite high level. And so the, the Holy Father may have already had his doubts. He may have wanted to put off, you know, he has that phrase that he uses all the time, that it's more important to start processes than to dominate spaces, by which he mm. means make decisions and then mm -hmm. impose them mm -hmm. uh, everywhere. So. It's his natural inclination to put things off, and, and Sarah and, and Benedict really put him on the spot in a way. But that may just have hurried him along. Unfortunately, Ganswein, who I think was trying to split the difference or smooth over whatever was going on between the, the two different mm -hmm. sides, I, I think that he, first of all, he made a number of missteps and then paid a price for it. Sandro Magister is reporting extensively on this, some exclusive stuff, Father Jerry, about how this transpired. It does appear he was caught in a crossfire here. It really does, because there was a direct contradiction between what Gens Archbishop Genswein said on uh, Monday of that week and then what was revealed by Cardinal Sarah. Genswein said that there was a misunderstanding between Sarah and, and Pope Emeritus Benedict. Mm. Uh, then Cardinal Sarah produced three letters, showed there was no misunderstanding, mm -hmm. and then Cardinal Sarah met with Pope Benedict twice on the Friday of that week and issued uh, three tweets at the end, Cardinal Sarah wow. saying, we both came to the realization there was no misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So, And that uh, meeting, by the way, according to Sandro Magister's reporting, is that Pope Benedict picked up the phone while Gunswine was at the public audience and invited Sarah over to his home. So this is done, the very idea that Benedict's kind of out of commission and babbling to himself in the corner is apparently not true. Not at all. And it's, it's most regrettable because Archie Genswein's a very good man mm -hmm. and he served the Pope and the Church very loyally. 
Uh, but Cardinal Sarah had to defend the integrity and truth of what happened. This book was not an accident forced on Pope Benedict. This was the result of two men's serious concerns to defend the tradition of the church and the theological understanding of the role of celibacy. Celibacy is not just something that was invented to produce personnel issues, you know. Mm -hmm. Or this to protect is, church yeah, property. Protect church, this is about being Jesus Christ in a new form, meaning the priest is the icon of Christ. Christ mm -hmm. ascends into heaven. But he leaves 12 apostles and he says, do this in memory of me. And who does that? The priest does it in per person of Christ. So mm -hmm. I, it's very unfortunate. I, I wish the best to Archbishop Genswein, but I'm very grateful for the witness of Sarah and, and Cardinal Sarah and Pope Benedict because they, they did a great thing. Very quickly, I want to move to Germany for a moment. Cardinal Gerhard Marx is the head of the German Bishops' Conference. He announced he's stepping down at the before the end of his term uh, in March. Um, he was the prime mover of this synodal path. How big a story is this? Well, I think it's a, an enormous story because he has been the figurehead, the, the leader right. of the, the German church. And at the various meetings in the Vatican, he's always been included in a very prominent way. Mm -hmm. We know that the Germans paid for the, uh, the, the Amazonian Synod, and so they had a large mm -hmm. stake in what, what was going on. It's very curious, I think, what's going on in Germany because there are cardinals like Cardinal Volki who have said that this synodal path that they have in Germany, which has got prelates and lay people together, is structurally not in accord with the understanding of what the church is. I mean, the church has an authority to preach mm -hmm. from Christ himself, the truth, the, the, to, to preach the truth about God and, and about man. Mm -hmm. I thought it was hilarious, that, but problematic, that Cardinal Volke was rebuked by a woman who was a part of one of these committees saying that model of authority is no longer valid. Now you ask yourself, well, how do we know that that model? <laughs> well, it's her authority, her personal authority, that that model of authority is, is no, no longer, longer valid. valid. So right. you begin to see the, the way that this, this is self, a self-refuting mm -hmm. uh, operation if what you're going to do is have people making decisions on a kind of a, uh, a democratic basis about what the, the truth of, of God and man is according mm -hmm. to the Catholic faith. I think that this is going to be very troublesome for the Holy Father going forward. He's tried to rein it in gently in the past, but I think it's going to become much a much sharper controversy in the very near future. I need to get to something that uh, is could have a major impact on this upcoming election season. Uh, Bishop McElroy in San Diego, Robert McElroy, delivered a speech in his diocese on February 6th where he seemed to elevate climate change over the issue of life in the pantheon of issues Catholics should consider in the upcoming elections. Here's what he said. How can one evaluate the competing claims that either abortion or climate change should be uniquely preeminent in Catholic social teaching regarding the formation of Americans as citizens or believers? The designation of either of these issues is the preeminent question in Catholic social teaching at this time in the U.S. will inevitably be hijacked by partisan forces to propose that Catholics have an overriding duty to vote for candidates that espouse that position. The death toll from abortion is more immediate, but the long-term death toll from unchecked climate change is greater and threatens the very future of humanity. Father Jerry, he seems to be downplaying the life issues at a time when the bishops, we just had uh, uh, Bishop Nauman on here a few weeks ago, say the bishops decided the life issue is the preeminent issue. What's going on here? Uh, there's a lot of obfuscation here. This is not a very helpful discussion. I think this should be put aside. Climate change, what he really means is man-made climate change, i.e., things that we're doing now to produce a change in the climate. You can't verify that and quantify it. You know, that's an impossibility right now on scientific knowledge. Leave that to the scientists. We know right now hundreds of thousands of children, millions are being killed. I think worldwide 50 million children a year die through mm -hmm. abortion. The United States has one of the most open abortion laws in all of Western world, in Western world the whole world. Mm -hmm. Abortion is a crime. It's a horrible injustice. It's the prime, premier human rights issue of our time. To then minimize it by saying, you know, global warming is going to kill more people. Um, this is not helpful at all. Well, there was just a report that the leader on reducing CO2 levels in the world, the leader, is the United States. Sure, sure. So uh, it seems our, 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 our vision is way off. And we see this also in the Democratic primaries. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, after Bernie Sanders 
Pete Buttigieg and others closed the door entirely to pro-life Democrats this week, saying you have no place in this party. Amy Klobuchar said, oh, sure, they're welcome. I, I supported adoption, but I believe Planned Parenthood should be funded. We should fund abortions abroad. Uh, we need to keep Roe v. Wade uh, moving forward. So it, it seems you have a party that is, has turned its back on this issue. Why would bishops attempt to, to somehow confuse or smudge that at this time? Well, Bishop McElroy, along with Cardinal Supich, were among the leaders of the opposition um, during the bishops' meeting for declaring that abortion was the preeminent issue. So it's not surprising yeah. the way that they did this. I'd like to encourage the, the viewers to read an article at the Catholic thing that Stephen White wrote a couple of days ago mm -hmm. called Prudence and Bishop McElroy, because he was making the argument that prudence leads us to think that we yeah. ought, ought to also keep it in, in mind, as we should, possible dangers to the environment. Sure. However, Steve says exactly this. There's a moral difference between trying to, to manage the situation in the global environment, mm. which is, is complicated, as Father says. We don't really know, and we can't tell where it's going to go, and we've got to keep our eyes open about that. But there's, there's a moral difference between advocating for that and directly willing the, the death of innocent human beings. So this is, these are entirely different approaches. They don't occupy the yeah. same moral, moral plane, and that is confusing because then you have Catholics duking it out in the, in the parish hall over, you know, well, but Bishop McElroy said, no, no, but I'm reading this from the bishop's conference. It's confusing to Catholics. So what they do is they throw their hands up and go, I'll just see which guy makes me happy or who makes a better speech. This is the problem. And if you don't teach it, it can have no effect in the public sphere. And that's the other larger difficulty. Final question, and this really runs to everything we've been talking about. Bishop uh, Marcello Sanchez Sorando, who is the chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, is defending his giving communion to a pro-abortion president in Argentina. He and his mistress were visiting the Vatican recently. Uh, is this licit, Father Jerry? No, our, uh, Archbishop Sanchez Sarando made a very big mistake, uh, both uh, pastorally and canonically. If someone comes to you who's living as a, uh, in a marital way with someone they're not married to, and you know this, and it's a public fact, because this is not a private citizen, this is the president, president of the country, of country yeah. you take him aside and say, you're welcome to come to Mass, but you cannot receive communion. The reason being, your public status as someone who's living in adulterous union with this woman renders you incapable of receiving communion. Mm. In addition, you have the moral concern to say, by the way, what benefit are you going to get from a sacrilegious communion? Because the presumption is you know that this is wrong, therefore you're guilty of a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. Pastorally, you say to people, look, are you, do you think this is right? Mm -hmm. And if he says yes, he said, well, you're wrong. If he says, I know it's wrong, good, then say, don't receive communion because you're only further offending mm -hmm. our Lord. We have to be concerned with souls here. Well, this so, president needs to be rebuked. So Rondo came out and said, it, it's up to the, and they quoted Benedict's letter to the uh, American bishops years ago, Ratzinger's then letter to them, where he says, look, th th this, is, this is outside. If someone's supporting abortion on demand, they shouldn't be receiving communion, but it, it's up to the bishop as how, how, to, how to execute that order, how to make that a reality. And he said, well, I made my ruling, and my decision was he can have communion. Well, mistake. Mistake. No, no, no. It's, it's wrong, wrong, wrong. It's not up to an individual bishop who works in the curia to solve this problem. He needs to be rebuked and told you can't receive communion. Bob. And he even went further. Our, our friend Diane Montagna actually interviewed him afterward yeah. and said, you know, isn't this a problem? Because yeah. we've seen there's, even earlier there's been this sort of creeping re redefinition of the Eucharist, that, yeah. that non-Catholics are being given the Eucharist in, in, says, in yeah. you know, so Diane brings this up with him and, and, and really, I think, beautifully pressed the point, and he accused her of being a fanatic, as mm -hmm. you and others in America are uh, fanatics about uh, pro-abortion politicians. I think that what she was just saying is, look, we take the, uh, uh, many of us, not only in the United States, we, mm -hmm. we take the Eucharist seriously. Yeah. And if you're going to, as Vatican II said, if you're going to regard the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life, mm -hmm. you don't just pass it out like crackers no. to any person who, who presents himself. Like the, that was actually yeah. what, what, what uh, our friend Eugenio Scalfredi said about the Pope, another scandalous thing that he said at one point, that the Pope said to him, anyone who comes will, will receive, whether they're Catholic mm -hmm. or, or in a state of grace or not. So this is a, I think that this might become another issue that we're going to be following in the mm -hmm. very near future of the nature of 
communion and who can and cannot receive. Well, uh, uh, to, to, to warp the old Flannery O'Connor line, if, this, if the Eucharist isn't what we've been taught it is, who gives a damn? Yeah. Yeah. Who gives a damn? Yeah. So it's really up to the church to defend who that is and then lay out the, the, the uh, opportunities and the guidelines for who can come forward and who can't. And the, the, the processes to get there. Gentlemen, thank you as always. We will meet Pleasure. again. Uh, Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, their commentary can be found at thecatholicthing.org. Check it out. He is the retired bishop of Hong Kong, and his was the loudest voice warning the Holy See against a deal with China, allowing the communist government a say in the appointment of Catholic bishops. His words fell on deaf ears, and the agreement was signed in 2018. Now the Chinese government is imposing even stricter rules on churches and religious groups. Aren't these the fruit of that ill-advised agreement? Here with an update on the persecuted church in his homeland is the Bishop Emeritus of Hong Kong, Joseph Cardinal Zen. Your Eminence, thank you for being here. Pleasure <laughs> to see you, you as always. Uh, I want to begin with the new rules that the communist regime announced in December, and it requires all religious personnel to support and implement total submission to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and, and this is already being implemented as we speak. Now, the new rules include six chapters, 41 new articles. I want to read, this is from Article 17 as an example of what these new rules include. Religious organizations must spread the principles and policies of the Chinese Communist Party as well as national laws, regulations, rules to religious personnel and religious citizens, educating religious personnel and religious citizens to support the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, supporting the socialist system, adhering to and following the path of the socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, th this, this is obviously an attempt to completely cyanize the church by the government, uh, and, and, and it really seems to be the fruit of this Vatican-China deal. Is that the case? Now, you see, uh, in China, there is no religious freedom because there is no freedom. Mm. You know, they are controlling the, the whole people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this uh, sur surveillance uh, camera. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it, it's nothing uh, really new uh, because uh, many uh, regulations are not new. They existed before, but they were not enforced. But now they enforce all those rules. Mm -hmm. So uh, since uh, Xi Jinping made himself uh, emperor, uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, enforcing strictly those laws. Huh? And, and did, how are Catholics in China reacting to this? <laughs> they, they can do nothing. There's as, nothing they can as do. As other people, they just uh, suffer. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to delve deeper into this. One of the results of these new rules, and we're beginning to see, especially now in the wake of the coronavirus, is that, and Americans and Europeans are pretty unaware of this, Christian funerals are no longer allowed. These new regulations state that the goal is to get rid of bad funeral customs while establishing a scientific civilized way of funerals. Now, clergy are no longer allowed to participate in funerals that take place at the homes of the faithful. Also, no more than 10 family members can be with the deceased. Oh. Or, and they're not allowed to read scripture or sing hymns. With all of this happening, do you think the faithful will try to maintain what's left of the underground church, Cardinal Zen? Now, this happened to both the underground and the right. official church. Right. You see? Uh, so... Uh, it, it's a, 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 a real tragedy for the whole church. Uh, those who can uh, still function, uh, uh, they are slaves of the, the new legislation. But uh, the underground church is going to disappear completely. Really? Yeah. Uh, I'm very, very sad to say that uh, all this happened uh, also because of the wrong policy in the Vatican. You see, mm. because uh, they they have done everything to 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 give the uh, uh, the church into the hands of, of the enemy. Mm. You see, the first act is that so-called uh, secret agreement. Right. The second act is to legitimize the seven bishops. Uh, the seven bishops they, who were excommunicated and part of yeah. the government-run church. Now they're legitimized. They've been brought in. They've been, the, the excommunications have been lifted. They are now the legitimate bishops in the land. 
and uh, and uh, uh, in the meantime, they have uh, uh, told the two legitimate bishops to step down. They've demoted them, basically. Demoted, yeah. One's on the run, which I want to yeah. talk about in a little bit. And With then the, the last act, even, even more terrible, mm -hmm. uh, the Holy See has encouraged everybody to join the political association, mm -hmm. to come into the open, and to obey the government. That's mm -hmm. terrible. That, yeah. I agree. Now, last month, a report was released by the U.S. Congressional Executive Commission on China that linked the rise in persecution toward Catholics to the Vatican-China deal, as Cardinal Zen was just mentioning. Here's what they wrote. In September of 2018, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs signed an agreement with the Holy See, paving the way for the unification of state-sanctioned and underground Catholic communities. Subsequently, local Catholic authorities subjected Catholic believers in China to increased persecution by demolishing churches, removing crosses, and continuing to detain underground clergy. Cardinal Zen, are you surprised at the speed with which the government enacted these uh, restrictions on the freedom of religion in China? And, and what becomes of the Catholic faithful? It, it's a tragedy, I said. Huh? And uh, uh, we, we can do nothing, uh, humanly speaking, because uh, uh, the, the two authorities uh, now agree on, on uh -huh. what is happening. Huh? And the so approval what, what of bishops. They're now the Chinese government can now approve bishops. They have veto power over bishop candidates. Uh, they they say uh, the Pope has a right to veto uh, the nomination by uh, the, the the communist authority. Uh -huh. But uh, I doubt uh, if uh, there is such thing in the in the agreement. You've never seen the agreement. No one has. No, I'm a Chinese candidate, and I'm not allowed to see the the agreement. Mm -hmm. Now the Chinese are uh, masters in uh, playing with words. Huh? So unless I can see the agreement, I don't believe that there's such a clear statement that the Pope has uh, the right of veto. Mm -hmm. uh but even suppose they they really uh, give you the uh, the right of veto, mm -hmm. how many times you can veto? Mm -hmm. Is there a limit on that? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, because you, 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 you will be embarrassed to, to veto indefinitely. Right, right. I, I want to mention something. You've been very vocal, as we said earlier, uh, in opposition of this Chinese-Vatican agreement. And in September, you wrote to the College of Cardinals, all your confreres, of which you are a member. Uh, I want to read some of this letter so the audience understands. Mm -hmm. You wrote, from my analysis of the document of the Holy See from June of 2019, pastoral guidelines of the Holy See concerning the civil registration of clergy in China, it's quite clear that it encourages the faithful in China to enter a schismatic church. Cardinal Parolin says that today, when we talk about the independent church, this independence should no longer be understood as absolute because the agreement recognizes the role of the pope in the Catholic Church. First of all, I cannot believe that there is such a statement in the agreement, and I do not see it. By the way, why must such an agreement be secret, and why am I not granted as a Chinese cardinal the right to see it, which you mentioned a moment ago? But even more clearly, the whole reality after the signing of the agreement shows that nothing has changed. Your Eminence, can we passively witness the murder of the church in China by those who should protect and defend her from her enemies? What response have you received from your fellow cardinals to that letter? Uh, not much. <laughs> not much? Not much. A few said just okay. We we pray for for your cause. And uh, uh, you see, I wrote that letter because uh, uh, when that document came out, I went immediately to Rome mm -hmm. and I asked uh, the Holy Father to arrange a a, a meeting uh, with me and Cardinal Parolin to discuss about that document. Huh? Uh, also because document. Uh, it's a very strange case. It came out without any signature, mm. without the specification from which the, the custody. Right. That never happened. No document mm -hmm. came from the Holy See, you see. And so uh, uh, I went there. Uh, the Holy Father invited me to supper, mm -hmm. and the uh, Palorino was there. Ah. He didn't say a word, but I was not granted a, a, a discussion.
Oh. So at the end of the supper, uh, I said, so Holy Father, may we have some uh, discussion about the, 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 the document? Holy Father said, eh, I'm going to uh, look into it. And that was it. And then he saw me at the door, uh, very kindly. Goodbye, thank you for dinner. Yeah. So that supper, wow. uh, surely arranged by Cardinal Parolin. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to tell me, you see, we are in front of the Holy Father, and listen to me and not to you. Mm. So just move along. Get lost. Yeah. Mm. You believe that this was a document that Pope Benedict did not sign while he was Pope? I mean that... Or uh, this yeah. type of agreement? That, yeah, that's, I, I believe. Why? And Why do you believe that? Because, uh, you see, uh, in the year 2010, there was so much rumor saying that, oh, agreement uh, is ready, it's ready. And then suddenly, complete silence. Mm. So uh, obviously, you can, you can understand that it was uh, the decision of uh, uh, Pope Benedict. Mm. But uh, you see, uh, people may not understand that why the Pope uh, wait the, till the last moment. Uh, because you must know Pope Benedict. He is a very shy person. Mm -hmm. He is very reluctant to use his power. He was very well aware that uh, they are uh, dealing with Chinese government, uh, you know, not following his instructions. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, you, you also wrote that you don't like this notion that the document calls the faithful to accept the decision of their pastors. That's a quote. Accept the decision of their pastors in China. Why not? What's the problem there? Uh, I don't know in, in what context. In the pastoral uh, guidelines, it, it says the faithful have to accept yeah. the decision of the pastor in all affairs, in all matters. You're not, you don't like that clause. Why not? Surely not, because uh, there are pastors who are not really pastors. Mm. They are uh, 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 helpers of the government. Agents of the state. Yeah, so mm -hmm. how can you follow those? Uh, you imagine those seven uh, legitimized bishops now. Uh, mm -hmm. They are terrible. Uh, you know, two, uh, uh, notoriously, they have a girlfriend and the children. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other uh, bishops uh, had posted so many uh, acts of defiance, uh, so scandalous people. So how can you obey to those pastors? Eh? What, are the pe what are you hearing from the faithful? Are they saying anything? Are they reaching out to you? Are they reaching out to others in, in mainland China? Uh, 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 with their upsetment, with their quiet rebellion, what's happening? Now, you see, I never contact people in China because it would be dangerous for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, some people uh, can come to Hong Kong to see me, mm -hmm. now it's more difficult these days. Huh? Right. But still somebody can come, so they ask, what should we do? Huh? What I can't tell them, I say, now if the Holy Father said it's okay to join the Patriotic Association, you should not blame people if they join, okay? Mm -hmm. We are not above the Pope. Huh? Mm -hmm. But fortunately, the document says, if your conscience say you should not join, they say, we respect your freedom. Now, that, that's also not correct because... There the is no freedom in China. No, the Holy See is not supposed to respect the, 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 the wrong conscience. They should enlighten. So if, if the Holy See says it's okay, mm -hmm. you should encourage people to join. Huh? Mm -hmm. So this is a hypocritical. Well, as you yeah. say in your letter, you say the abnormal has become normal. Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah. Yeah. The, the normal now become to join the political association. Mm -hmm. And those who refuse to do that, they are exception, uh, tolerated. I need to get your reaction to what's happening on the ground. Bishops and priests are being kicked out of parishes. At least five large parishes have closed since the beginning of the year. And one has, has at least 10,000 parishioners. Now, there is a bishop who's faithful, the Bishop of Mingdong, Monsignor Vincenzo Gao, who is now homeless. He's sleeping on the street. Yeah. Following the Vatican-China agreement and the lifting of the excommunication of Bishop Zahn by Pope Francis, Bishop Gao, who was already ordained, he agreed to be demoted to auxiliary bishop and left the ordinary seat to Bishop Zahn. However, Bishop Gao never signed up for membership in this uh, government-run church. 
and he's now been downgraded to the status of, of a homeless person, a migrant. The Chinese government is claiming that the closure of his parish and evictions were due to fire codes. Why isn't the Vatican objecting to this? This is a validly ordained bishop. He agreed with everything. He marched to the Vatican's tune, and now he's on the run, essentially. Yeah. I did, I, you know, uh, when I learned this uh, news, I said, more that that may be exaggerated, because the bishop has the 80 percent of the priests and the faithful under him, wow. following him, and the only small group following the the, the, the new bishop legitimized Zahn, bishop. Yeah. This new bishop. Basically. And so I yeah. said, oh, many are ready to 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 accept him uh, in their family, but then I learned that the government said nobody should take him. No one should take him in. Uh, in uh, yes, that, that's why the, the news says he's on the street. <laughs> mm, unbelievable. And they're uh, watching. Incredible. They're watching everything. There's incredible. cameras everywhere. Incredible. There's surveillance. And then uh, we have still bishops uh, uh, in prison. Huh? Mm -hmm. And the Vatican doesn't say any word uh, in favor of, of these bishops. Incredible. The, the bishop in the, in the Pauding. Huh? Wow. This More is, than 20 years. It, it, this is unbelievable. I, I mean, as a, as a faithful Catholic watching, this is just unbelievable. They got nothing. That, what did they get from the deal? They I was going to ask you nothing. that next. They got nothing, nothing at all. Then why sign the deal? You ask them. <laughs> uh, I wish I could. I will. I will. One of these days, I will. <laughs> Cardinal Togley was recently appointed as the prefect of the Congregation of Evangelization of Peoples by the Pope, the former Cardinal of the Philippines. Uh, now, the care of the Church of China will now fall under his department. Although the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Parolin, the author of that agreement, remains in place, Cardinal Togley is not a diplomat. He's from the Philippines. He's lived under President Durante. He's also close with Pope Francis. Do you think we'll see any changes in the status quo with Togley coming aboard? Now, uh, I really... Uh, cannot understand uh, why uh, Cardinal Filoni uh, uh, should step down just two years before he reached 75 years. Mm. Uh, my suspicion is that uh, <coughs> he is not completely collaborating with Paroli. Mm. Uh, you see, when this document came out, I asked uh, Cardinal Filoni, uh, I said, oh, you don't have to, to answer my question, but my suspicion is that you may have refused to sign that document. And he said, nobody asked me to sign that document. Mm -hmm. Now, this document is a competence of the Congregational Evangelization, and he was, has not been asked to sign. Mm -hmm. Then I asked also the Congregation for doctrine, hmm. the prefect, I said, uh, uh, you are supposed to, to, uh, to be briefed on, on all the documents coming from any department. Have you seen this document? And he said, no, everything concerning the church in China is in the hands of Cardinal Parolin. Hmm. So that's, those are facts, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think uh, Cardinal Takele can do anything in this respect. Hmm. I want to move on to the Hong Kong protests, of which you have joined. You've joined those protests. Uh, sure. Tell but, me. Uh, you know. Go ahead. We joined peacefully. Yes. Uh, joined the, uh, the, the march of uh, one, one million, two million. I was right. there. Okay? Yes. But uh, there is a group uh, of brave people, we say, we call. Mm -hmm. uh, the young people, mm -hmm. uh, they think, uh, you know, we achieve nothing with those uh, peaceful marches. So. Mm -hmm. They are taking some more energetic action. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we we are with them, yeah. but uh, we are a little worried because, about the violence. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, you know, uh, at the beginning, the so-called violence is uh, you know ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They uh, they say they set fire, mm -hmm. but they set fire just to in the middle of the street. Some, uh, in yeah. the middle of the street. Yeah. Okay, but now they threw petrol bombs, uh -huh. so dangerous. Mm -hmm. so, but still, we, we are one, yeah. because we are fighting. Well, it's the people wanting their freedom and want to yeah, protect we, their we, freedoms. We want our freedom. Where is the church on this? I mean, is this just another example where the church has decided to silence itself, probably because of the secret agreement? 
Not, not so much because of that, because we are uh, still nominally independent right. uh, from of that. China, yeah. Uh, Mainland China. But uh, uh, you see, in Hong Kong, you have this uh, uh, association of the six religions. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that organization is uh, very much uh, victim of the uh, United Front uh, policy of the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. So they come out always to say something neutral. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we like to have peace, uh, reconciliation, etc. But in this moment, <laughs> you cannot be neutral yeah. because it's obvious that we are on the side of the victims. Mm -hmm. We are being persecuted by the government. Huh? And uh, uh, the Christian religions, uh, Protestant and Catholic, we are... Uh, uh, we have been rather visible in, in this last uh, yes, uh, very protest. Much. Uh, uh, but you see, uh, the, uh, the, the Catholic establishment uh, uh, is divided. Mm -hmm. we, have, uh, we have no bishop at this moment. Well, they claim there's this Peter, uh, Father Peter Choi who's been appointed, though no official appointment has been made. Have you heard this? Is there an appointment? Yeah, uh, you see, it's already very sad that uh, uh, such a problem uh, comes out in the open because we hope to, uh, to, to have all those things uh, uh, in a more reserved way. It's internal uh, discussion, but now it's in it open. Uh, so they right. say uh, the, the future bishop needs a blessing from Beijing. Mm -hmm. Now, we have an auxiliary bishop, Bishop Ha, very good. Mm -hmm. And he really is a, a, a wise leader of the community during this last month. Huh? Right. But uh, I know that uh, the actual uh, pontifical delegate, Cardinal Tong, uh, he re uh, receives instruction from the, the Vatican. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, he must follow those instructions. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose... Uh, uh, they are always on the line of uh, compromise, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, he he courageously came out uh, twice also uh, to say uh, we need a independent commission of investigation. Huh? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I hope uh, uh, the Holy See in this moment may understand better that they have to to reflect on this policy going on. Uh, these last years, and especially this last month. And so. you believe that they are awaiting sign-off on this new appointment, the new Hong Kong bishop? Actually, from some news, mm -hmm. I learned that uh, at the beginning, they even, uh, was, uh, the, the Vatican was even in favor of Bishop Ha. Mm -hmm. But maybe because of uh, uh, what he's doing during this month, mm -hmm. uh, they are afraid that... Uh, it would inflame the, uh, yeah. the, the, the communist so, government. And uh, so they, they prefer this uh, uh, Father Choi, who is uh, much more friendly with uh, uh, the, the, the authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is a, a group of young Catholics uh, very strongly against uh, uh, this nomination. Mm. So they say that now they are looking for a, a third name. I don't know. Uh, no, we shall it, see. Yeah. <laughs> but before I let you go, how is the coronavirus in Hong Kong? Oh, terrible. Uh, we wear the mask uh, all uh -huh. the time. We don't go outside uh, without absolute necessity. Mm. And the people uh, empty all the stores. Huh? Oh. And, uh, and uh, we remove the SARS, you see? Mm -hmm. And this is even more dangerous <laughs> because the symptoms are not that clear. Yeah. You may not have fever. Right. And uh, when, when the, the symptoms come out, it's too late. Huh? Mm. So the people are very much afraid. Huh? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Your Eminence, we will leave it there. Thank you for being here. Always a pleasure to have you. And I, I want to remind people, your new book, For Love of My People, I Will Not Keep Silent, is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Get a copy. It's a wonderful insight into the China situation, his ministry, and much more. Well, that is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook? You can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, 
will be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. Keep the Chinese Catholics and faithful in your prayers. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.